All right, today we have another episode from the archives with one of my incredible guests. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. You ready to do it? I'm ready. All right. All right. Here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am thrilled to have back Lisa Ferenc, uh on the podcast. Lisa, welcome again. Thank you. Great. I always love being with you. Awesome. So as uh, you probably know or should know, Lisa is a recognized expert in the strengths-based depathologized treatment of trauma and has been in private practice for 34 years. She presents workshops and keynote addresses nationally and internationally and is a clinical consultant to practitioners and mental health agencies in the United States, Canada, and the UK and Ireland. Lisa has been an adjunct faculty member at University of Maryland School of Social Work, University of Baltimore at Maryland, University of Maryland Department of Family Medicine, and is a founder of the Forens Institute, formerly known as the Institute for Advanced Psychotherapy Training and Education, now in its 12th year. Uh, in 2009, Lisa was voted Social Worker of the Year by the Maryland Society for Clinical Social Work. She's the author of Treating Self-Destructive Behaviors and Trauma Survivors, a, Cl- a Clinician's Guide, now in its second edition. Uh, also, Letting Go of Self-Destructive Behaviors, a Workbook of Hope and Healing, and also, finding your ruby slippers, transformative life lessons from the therapist's couch. Awesome. Um, all right. So before we dive in here, um, remind our listeners and myself, where are you currently right now? I'm, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. I'm in, but I'm also in limbo like everybody else in the world, right? Okay. <laughs> so I'm in Baltimore and I'm in limbo just like you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how are you doing? Just. Oh, thank you for asking. Yeah. I would say mostly really well. And I think I'm doing everything in my power to lead with gratitude. Um, You know, I have to tell you as a clinician, I did not lose a day of practice and I'm extraordinarily grateful for that. And um, you may or may not know, but I I like to, I actually call myself Wilma Flintstone in that I was of the um, absolute adamant belief that therapy could only happen face to face. I would never, ever do anything online. And my institute, all of our trainings in Baltimore have always been live as well. And I have to say that it's been, um, although there's been a learning curve, it's it's actually been gratifying to discover that Mm. there are ways to transfer this work. And again, I just am holding with a lot of gratitude that I was able to continue to do the therapy with my clients and continue to offer our trainings in an online format. So, you know, that's that's gone a long, long way towards um, allowing me to navigate what for most of us has been very challenging and mm-hmm. difficult. Yeah. yeah. Was, um, is, is there, are there two sides to that? You said you didn't miss a beat in, far, in terms of seeing clients was obviously that's good, but it yes. seems like it might be challenging. It's like you're trying to get deal with the the, the present situation too. You're you're right, and I've actually it's interesting. One of the the talks that I've been asked to do in many different iterations now online um, is exactly that. You know, helping mental health providers to be able to hold their own. You know reactions and, and emotions about all of this and still be arbiters of hope for our mm-hmm. clients. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it's really, really challenging and we have to learn how to kind of contain and compartmentalize and, and continue to have that balance so that we're making sure that we're taking care of ourselves and processing, you know, with whomever we feel safe processing with the impact that all of this is having on us so that we really can stay fully grounded and present for our clients. Well, let's let's dive a little bit into that. I mean, what has it been like for you to to do this? 
Yeah. Um, again, initially I was very reticent. I, you know, I, as you know, I work with profoundly traumatized folks and for me, energetically being in the same room with somebody, you know, is three quarters of the work as far as I'm concerned. Um, being able to see their whole body, being able to, you know, read all of those nonverbal cues, such an essential part of, of the work that most of us who are trauma informed, you know, include in, in, in the paradigms that we use. And so, you know, to get a profile of somebody and to feel, you know, that there's some degree of distance because there's glass between us. Um, in the beginning, it was, it was challenging. It was so you, in, in the therapy room, there's a big sheet of glass standing up there as well as your masks and so forth or whatever. Yeah. Well, no. So I, I immediately, I, I see, I would not do therapy wearing masks. Okay. So I stopped, I stopped in person therapy a year ago now. Okay. Um, you know, I felt that that it would be so triggering for a trauma survivor to attempt to feel com to, comfortable and safe with me if they can't see this much of my face. <laughs> right. You know? Um, and it would make it really difficult for me to fully appreciate and understand what was happening for them if I can't see their whole face. And so I immediately, you know, transferred into the online format. So, you know, I see the whole face and there are definitely okay. times when we're working with the body. I'll invite the client to lower their screen so I can really see their breathing and have, have a clearer sense of, you know, what's happening for them. Um, but it's challenging. They, they have, they get interrupted. Um, so many folks have young children children who are either doing 100% virtual learning or hybrid learning, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I do therapy sessions and I have always, I've learned to ask, you know, do you have privacy? Are you alone in the room? Is there the likelihood that will be interrupted? What do you have to do as soon as you click uh, end meeting with me? Because, you know, many, many folks have stayed very committed to doing therapy, but they click end meeting and five seconds later, they're back on Zoom doing a business meeting. So, you know, that context is important that for therapists to take into consideration mm. because it's going to dictate how deeply we go, how emotional, you know, the client is going to get in that session and how much time I'm going to leave at the end of the session to do containment and regrounding, really making sure they're fully back in their prefrontal cortex. You know, if they have to leave with me and then, you know, sound <laughs> intelligent in a business meeting. Right. So, What's the part of the loss? And, you know, I've always said so much of COVID is about loss, you know, so many different kinds of losses. But one of the losses that for clients and therapists alike is that transitional space where a client, you know, could end a session and then maybe even sit in their car for a couple mm -hmm. of minutes drive home, have a drive home, uh, you know, have that space so that they can decompress so that they, so that they can do a little bit of containment so that they can allow some of what came up to kind of resettle. And that's not happening, you know, mm -hmm. or, um, very committed clients who want to still do the weekly work, but the context is completely different. You know, they do the work and then they have to help their kid with algebra. So, uh, you know, that's, that's been challenging. That's interesting. I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, the challenges of, of uh, doing things on online with Zoom, for example, but not so much about the context, like you're saying, well, what are you doing exactly afterwards? You know, is there going to be that uh, space? Can you take the space, which also impacts what you're going to be doing or able to do in session as well, too? Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so I think it's requiring uh, both the therapist and the client a tremendous amount of fluidity and flexibility and spontaneity. Um, and, you know, we can be working on something for two, three weeks, you know, that's very deep and rich. But in the fourth visit, if the client says to me, listen, my kid's in the next room, you know, we shift gears. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you have to allow for that kind of flexibility, given that larger you know, contextual reality right now. What are you seeing, Lisa, in terms of how your clients are just dealing with all this? And I, I realize everyone has their own story, but uh, in general, are people coming to you just even more burdened? I mean, to me, just let me just say this, when the, all this stuff hit for me, I was nuts. I mean, I was so anxious, right? I was someone who, and still 
am, I love to keep abreast of the news. Mm -hmm. And I just found myself, you know, the kids were home suddenly. My wife, fortunately, was able to work. Mm -hmm. And then now I've got two kids and all this crazy news. I was going nuts. I was like, if I'm going to keep it together, I've got to stop and stop, you know, create some boundaries for myself, which fortunately I did. But it's, it's still very, very challenging. Yeah, yeah, you're hitting on something. I'm so glad you brought it up because with any other intervention that we're doing as clinicians right now, I still think one of the most powerful and necessary interventions is really being directive with our clients about saying, stop watching the news, stop (laughs) getting so, you know, Stop going down the rabbit hole of social media. Um, Certainly do not watch the news before you go to bed. Uh, This has become something I'm reminding my clients about pretty much every session, Mm -hmm. because whether it's COVID or it's politics or it's civil unrest or, you know, unfortunately, we've had a confluence of a lot of really frightening and anxiety producing things in our world in the last year. Uh, And so, you know, what clients eventually do figure out is that when they make this this conscious effort to not go down that rabbit hole, so to speak, they are less anxious. They do feel mm-hmm. calmer. And by the way, watching the news all day long doesn't help you in any way, right? Um, because so much of what's happening is not in our control. Um, and all it's going to do is activate, you know, your sympathetic system. It's going to put you in either fight, flight, or freeze reaction. And so the control you have is, is about creating those boundaries and limiting how your exposure, Because I think there's a lot of vicarious traumatization literally just around watching the news or the divisiveness that keeps showing up in social media right now. So I think that that's critically important. Uh, I think there is a bit of a universality, although you're absolutely right to suggest that, you know, people react differently. And I think the more you come at this with a trauma history, the more you're going to be triggered and the more impactful that triggering is going to be. But I think there's a kind of universality to a lot of the key issues that COVID and and other issues that have happened in the world have kind of raised and exacerbated for us as human beings. So that's, you know, we touched on losses. So there's the loss of freedom and the loss of finances and the, and the loss of employment for a lot of people and the loss of life, mm-hmm. um, you know, and the fear of getting sick, um, the loss of freedom. Uh, I'm, I'm working with so many clients now, guy who have experienced a death and they couldn't have a funeral. You know, for Jewish clients, they couldn't sit Shiva, which is a seven day process, which is essential, you know, to help us to begin to navigate our grief and our suffering. So many younger people who couldn't go to a graduation, you know, mm-hmm. young couples who couldn't get married in, in the way they wanted to get married. So a lot of loss around um, activities and social engagements and connection. And that's been huge. And if you're a trauma survivor, you've already endured tremendous loss in your life, you know, loss of safety and pride privacy and boundaries and protection. So the whole concept of loss, I think, can be very, very triggering. And then there's this huge dynamic of uncertainty. And all of us as human beings are impacted by uncertainty. We don't like to not know what's going on, you know, and if there's a blank, we're going to fill it in. We're going to make stuff up if we have to, because that feels less anxiety producing than limbo and not knowing. And now the uncertainty has shifted to uh, including things like, when am I going to get vaccinated? And how do I even go about getting vaccinated? That's something that my clients have been in the last three or four weeks. They're constantly wanting to process in a a therapy session. Um, And just, of course, the relentlessness of everything that's happening. I think one of the biggest triggers, though, is the the need to do physical distancing. And I I like to use the term physical distancing as opposed to social distancing, Mm -hmm. because we can't afford to do social distancing. We have to keep finding ways to connect. One of the interesting things to, to, to notice or to know is that when we're threatened, when we're stressed, when we're overwhelmed or frightened, it is literally in our DNA and in our biology to reach out and do social engagement. And so think about that. We're wired to want to do social connection in response to anxiety, fear, or overwhelm. And yet what we've been forced to do for almost for a year now is social disconnection, 
right? To maintain that six feet, to wear that mask, to not go to all the places that you normally go to, you know, that give you comfort, that help you to feel, that give you a sense of identity or a sense of belonging, you know, the communal um, gatherings that we all need in our lives and in order to feel connected. So although it's absolutely necessary, and I do want to emphasize this, I'm not in any way saying don't do physical distancing. It's obviously necessary, you know, for, for our physical and medical safety, but it's really not good for our emotional and psychological well-being. And a lot of people are experiencing PTSD around that degree of isolation mm -hmm. and feeling that degree of disconnection. Um, in general, Guy, there's going to be a ton of PTSD fallout from all of this. Um, the mental health aspect of everything that we've had to go through and endure, you know, in an, in an attempt to stay safe. And so, you know, I tell my colleagues, like, get ready, because we're going to, we already are seeing dramatic increase in substance use and relapsing, dramatic, in, dramatic increase in domestic violence, in child abuse and sexual abuse, in depression, in anxiety. Anxiety, and that's yeah. real, right? You know? Right. And we're we're going to have to deal with that as as mental health providers and help people navigate. Oh, man, it, it just feels like there's this constant backdrop to all of our all of ourselves and all of our lives of all these things that you talked about, and it it's it's um yeah. I mean, for someone like myself who tends to you know the needle tends to go toward more towards anxiety it's it's a day-to-day recentering and recalibrating you know to keep it together you're right you're right what i say to my clients is if you get too focused on what you cannot control in all of this your anxiety is going to dramatically escalate i think the challenge and the opportunity and you know you know i take a very strengths-based approach to everything so i i try to frame it as opportunity i think the opportunity opportunity right now is to really get um, clearer about what is in our control and to make sure that we are fully and proactively using our agency around mm. the things that are in our control. For example, for example, so practicing simple little strategies that help to navigate and reduce anxiety to, to with a lot of intentionality, whether you want to bring on board mindfulness or meditation, um, becoming more aware of doing um, guided imagery or breath work, downloading free apps onto your phone, you know, that walk you through very simple guided imagery and meditation for anxiety management, I think that's huge. Um, if you can't go to the gym and a lot of us can't because it does, it just doesn't feel safe to do that. I've discovered all these fabulous new exercise, free exercise videos on YouTube. So I've become the queen of finding new exercise videos. That's so yeah. funny. Cause I have too. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and then I pass them on to my clients. I'm like, you know, I just did this fabulous 10,000 step walking thing, you know, that, that like really worked up a sweat and I needed this much space in my living room, you know, um, or, or, you know, again, meditation, yoga. I have a lot of clients who've discovered yoga for the first time, you know, doing it online. Um, we can make, we have control about our nutrition, you know, mm -hmm. what we choose to eat and what we're not eating. We have control about our sleep and are we getting enough sleep? Um, you know, we have control about making those social connections in safe ways. Um, you know, I, I am doing more cocktail zoom hours with, friends, you know, than I've ever done. Um, so it's really just kind of taking that half a step back and focusing on what is in your control and then really, you know, making it an intention to engage in that, you know, reading things that are fun. I'll tell you something else that I have become addicted to, and that's jigsaw puzzles, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzles. Now, when I first started doing it, it was kind of a way just to, to fill up some of my free time because I had, you know, I wasn't traveling. I wasn't giving trainings on the road. I had a lot of, suddenly I wasn't in airports anymore. So I had a lot of downtime. And then I did a little bit of research and I was delighted to discover that doing things like jigsaw puzzles, Sudoku, crossword puzzles, this has an actual impact on our brain and our brain chemistry. You're activating the left and right hemisphere, jigsaw puzzles, 
puzzles and these other activities are meditative. So again, they calm down anxiety. They're distracting in a good way so that if you're the type of person who's been perseverating about COVID, you know, focusing on Sudoku or crossword puzzle or jigsaw puzzle just gives your mind another place to go. Uh, actually releases in do dopamine, which makes us gives us pleasure and makes us feel good and and positive. Um, if you're if you're isolating with someone else and you work on a jigsaw puzzle together, you know that's something that feels connecting and collaborative. Um, I have clients who are doing jigsaw puzzles, the same jigsaw puzzle at the same time with somebody on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So even though they're not in the same space, you know, they're they're kind of working on it together and they're, you know, they're lowering their screen to show the other person, you know, where they're at and what right, they've right. done. You know, so that's all the stuff that actually is still in our control. Right, and that's right. what we got to grab onto and, and take advantage of right now. I can see where that might even feel more elusive because there's so much seemingly out of our control. So, so easy to get overwhelmed with that, that almost like, you know, uh, thinking about uh, and collecting, gathering what we can take a hold of almost might seem elusive, but... So, so crucial. Um, let's, uh, you know, you mentioned a fallout and one of the things that, um, you know, it's been, been, a lot of people have been talking about, although I don't think it's been talked a lot about in, in, uh, generally speaking is how all of this is, you know, falling out down on, on the mental health clinicians and how they're going to deal with it, the fallout with them. Yeah. What are you experiencing and or seeing? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of fallout. I will tell you, you know, in addition to doing, you know, therapy hours, I also provide consultation to clinicians, whether they're beginner clinicians or very seasoned clinicians. In the last four, four or five months, I have been, um, and I'm happy, I'm always so thrilled to do it, but I'm noticing this dramatic increase in the number of colleagues who are wanting to do consultation because they just need a safe place to process their mm -hmm. own anxiety. Um, you know, just to, just to deal with the frustration that they're feeling about having to continue to do online therapy as opposed to face-to-face -face therapy. Um, a safe place just to process their, their own fear and uncertainty about COVID and, and, you know, other things that are happening in the world. And so I, I do think if you are a clinician, the two things to get really focused on is give yourself the gift of consultation supervision right now, because you deserve it. It, it will benefit you. It is a safe place where you can unload and process your own fears, because obviously we can't unload them in a therapy session with a client. Um, we need a safe place to be able to do that. And we need a safe place just to be able to process the anxiety that our clients are bringing to these online sessions, you know? So consultation and supervision, I think now more than ever is a real gift. And I also think we have to stay mindful of our own acts of self-care and self-compassion. So no matter what modality you use, and I use many, many as a, as a clinician, I've become more and more convinced that that what makes everything work is when you bring self-compassion to it. And the irony guy is that clinicians are often not that great. They're extraordinarily compassionate towards other people, right? I mean, that's why they're in the field that they're in, but they're not always great with self-compassion and they're not always great with self-care. And so, you know, again, really bringing that into your conscious awareness to just put your hand on your heart and say, you know what? It's really hard right now. It's hard to be a mental health provider. It's hard to be a medical provider. It's hard to be a teacher. It's hard to be a parent with three young children who are trying to learn at home. So just bringing a little bit of compassion to that reality, as simplistic as that seems, again, the anxiety comes down. Just as you said that, I could feel it. Seriously. Yeah. I could feel that. Yeah. So the self-talk is hugely important. Mm. You know, if we're shaming ourselves about the fact that we're struggling, we're going to feel worse. If we can hold compassion and kindness and concern and care for the fact that this has been one hell of a year and it's hard and we're doing the best that we can. And if we can be kind to ourselves about that reality, 
again, our bodies soften, our physiology calms down, and we create this space to begin to think about acts of self-care. So Mm -hmm. once I can acknowledge it's hard to be a mental health provider right now, the next question that it evokes is, so what do I need? What do I need to do for me? So that, so that I can navigate this. Right. And what I've discovered is not to schedule clients back to back in online therapy because, because I'm immobile. I'm staring at my camera. You know, I've got blue light coming at me. I can't do that for six hours in a row. You know, in my office, yes, I, I'm good at seeing, you know, four or five clients or not that I'm necessarily advocating that, but after 37 years, it, it comes easily to me, but this doing this, you know, four or five hours in a row. No, my body doesn't want me to do that. So once I realized that I gave myself compl- uh, permission to completely change the way I schedule mm-hmm. online therapy sessions, it's very different than what I do in my office. I'm making sure in between every session, I'm standing up and moving. I, I have that jigsaw puzzle going at all times. You know, I'm in my 30, uh, seriously, my husband and I, and he's he, he's a physician and he's just as stressed as I am. And we, we're working on our 35th puzzle and it's been a godsend, you know? He comes home at the end of the day, you know, after doing, you know, 20, he does 25 tele- telehealth sessions in a row, you know? And then he sits down with that puzzle and it's like everything sort of dissolves, you know? And, and again, we can be in a different part of our brain, um, making sure that I'm, eating properly, you know, in little small ways throughout the day. Uh, Again, different from the way that I would work in my office, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. kind of in one place all day. Um, Walking my dog in between sessions has been another godsend. And if you don't have an animal, a pet, just walk, you know, Uh just walk around your house, walk outside, walk up and down the steps, let your body move. Because there is this, I think this greater degree of of being sedentary and being more immobilized because we are all doing this all day. We're staring at our screens, you know, and that immobility is not good for our bodies. Is, is this situation of COVID, is it making it more challenging for clinicians, therapists to wonder about to what degree they should disclose their own feelings of, of anxiousness, right? Yeah. Cause it's something uniquely that we're all experiencing. Yeah. 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 I think you still, ha- I think there's a way to do it guy. I think that, yes, we want to normalize the humanity of this and that we are all in this together. And when a client says, you know, um, I feel scared or I feel anxious or I feel exhausted, you know, he's certainly saying, I get it. I totally get it without going into any detail about what that means. You know, I think that that's a really appropriate way to do a little bit of self-disclosure, you know, um, in the name of joining and Mm -hmm. and speaking to the universality of it all. But I'm still going to tell you that the clinician's job is to be um, the arbiter of hope and, and optimism. And, you know, my fundamental rule about therapy in general is somebody has to be grounded and present at all times. And it better be the therapist because it's often not the client. Mm -hmm. And so when my client, you know, I'm thinking about, I I did a couple of sessions last night and I had in both cases, clients who are very dysregulated. One was crying, one was really anxious and angry. And I had to stay really calm and really present um, so so that their mirror neurons could bounce off of that and and they could begin to calm down and get some some relief if I met them you know so they're up here right and if I if you meet the client where they are then who's doing the great you know where, where's the stabilizing factor you know so yes we definitely can normalize for our clients that we're frustrated we're anxious we're angry we're bored we haven't we haven't mentioned that emotion but i think that's a really big emotion that people are grappling with they're bored the microcosm of their world has dramatically decreased mm-hmm. You know, um, we're doing much less than we normally do. Right. And and so there's boredom uh, around that. And and just to normalize, yeah, there are times you're going to feel really, really bored and anxious and angry. And um, I get it. We're all in the same boat. I think, you know, saying things like that is valuable because um, I'm, I'm not any different from my clients. The extent to which I'm going to share why I'm anxious, I'm not going to go there. Right. 
you know, because it, first of all, it's their session, it's their time. Right. And, and again, I want them to really trust that they can rely on me. And actually I find it quite gratifying when a client says, um, I feel so good when I interact with you because I feel calmer mm-hmm. or I feel more optimistic. You know, um, I, I try to bring humor into the sessions, you know, even when it's difficult. I was working with a woman yesterday who's still grieving the death of her husband. And believe it or not, I would say four different times we were both laughing in the session. And she thanked me for that. She said, you know, I've been so consumed with grief and sadness. It actually feels good to laugh. And then she was cute. She goes, is it OK that I'm laughing? You know, so um, just giving that permission, you know, yes, that's as healing as crying, you know. Um, So I think we do have to find ways to take care of ourselves when we're not in session with our clients so that we really can be hopeful and optimistic and fully present when we're with them. Clients need that more than ever. So the Institute now, are you folks... uh, offering courses online or workshops? Yep. So everything is online and, you know, I'm, I I didn't think it was possible and it is, and I'm delighted that it is. And so I still have a fabulous faculty. I do a lot of teaching. My, my faculty does teaching. I'm still able to do my certificate program in trauma treatment online. So just going to the Ferentz Institute, you know, will give you the whole, the whole calendar. Okay. And, and consultation also? Yes. So um, if you go to the Ferentz Institute, it's the easiest way to email me. And I'm more than happy to provide that. I I really feel like um, that's something that I can provide. You know, I've disclosed this before. I'm not a trauma survivor. So um, I tend to be by nature, a very optimistic, positive, hopeful person. And so I can I I like being able to provide that hope and that optimism, not that I'm a Pollyanna about anything and not Mm -hmm. that we ever minimize or downplay suffering, you know, but I think that we can juxtapose suffering with hope and certainly suffering with compassion. And so I'm more than happy to, you know, to be able to provide that to clinicians who feel stressed and overwhelmed and um, frankly, just want a little bit of extra guidance about doing this work online because it is different. You know, doing trauma work in particular online, Mm -hmm. it's not the same thing as doing it face to face. Lisa, what is it about you, do you think, that enables you or allows you to maintain this hopefulness, the, 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 you know, the positivity? And I'm not saying you are Pollyanna, but what is what is it about you? What do you think? It's a great question, actually. What immediately comes to my mind is that I was blessed with extraordinary parents. I lucked out. I just was blessed with extraordinary, loving, uh, kind parents who made me feel special, you know, not in a narcissistic way, but just made me feel worthy and valuable and precious every day. And, Mm. um, and, And they were optimistic, positive people, despite the fact that both my parents came from their own. uh, They found they were remarkably optimistic human beings. And thank God brought that into their parenting. The other thing I'll, I'll tell you, and this is not to proselytize, but, you know, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I'm a person of faith. And when stuff like this happens, I just turn it over. I just turn it over. I'm so convinced that there is a force at play that has so much more power than I do. And I just turn it over, you know, Um, and that helps me to not have to carry the heaviness and the weight of worry. Mm. And I think that if you don't, if you, if you go through life and you're not perpetually worried and you do believe, I believe in the goodness of humanity. I believe in the goodness of, of a higher power of God. You know, if you hold that idea um, and you just, you trust that, that ultimately things are actually going to, to be okay. Awesome. Well, Lisa, like I said, I love having you on here, man. Anytime you want to come on, send me a, send me an email. Um, We'll have everything we talked about today linked up at the uh, uh, trauma therapist podcast.com, the show notes page. And um, want to want people to uh, reach out to you and your Institute. Um, So awesome. Yes. And allow me please to publicly thank you because you have done extraordinary work. Uh, I get emails from people guy, like, 
you know, from around the world who've listened to your podcasts and have caught the ones that you and I have done. So I just want you to know that you are making a profound difference in the mm. world. And I thank you for your, your well, spirit and your generosity. Thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. We'll be in touch. Good. Be well. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.